it's almost our duty as urbanists to highlight good examples that are already happening in our cities and are and have been done. It is very easy to kind of complain about the city's not doing enough, that Charlotte is too sprawled out, et cetera, et cetera, which is true, but there's also a ton of great examples in Charlotte right now of great walkability, great bikeability, the, the bike networks, there's a rail, there's a, you know, a light rail going right through the city. There are great examples of all these ideals in play. And I think we should maybe think about doing a little bit more to highlight the positive instead of constantly you know, fighting against the negative. I think people like to support positive messaging. And so I think if you, ju if you keep showing people, hey, you're in Charlotte, don't you like these few neighborhoods? Yes, we, shouldn't we build some more <laughs> neighborhoods like this? Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Tesho Akindeli uh, from Charlotte, North Carolina. A former MLS soccer player, uh, formerly at Dallas, as well as Orlando, and now, an urbanist. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about some of the projects that he is involved with and how he got passionate about building more walkable, bikeable places. Uh, and it is a good one. So let's get right to it with Tesha. Well, Tesha, thank you so much for joining me in the Active Towns podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. I'm glad we could we could make this this come to life. Absolutely. I know we're, we're both really busy. We're kind of frazzled at the moment, but we're going to have some fun here for sure. Hey, Ed, go ahead and take a moment to uh, introduce yourself. Who is Tesho? Yeah, so Tesho, I guess, you know, I was born in Canada. I grew up most of my life in Colorado where, you know, I was going to school. I thought I was going to be an electrical engineer. Plans changed. I became a professional soccer player for nine years. Um, and now I describe myself as an urbanist. And I'm a real estate developer and just a big fan of, you know, all, all that is urbanism, walkability, and my mission is really build better neighborhoods. So kind of went from engineering path, soccer, all the way to urbanism. And I, I think this is the foreseeable, foreseeable future for me here. Fantastic. So uh, whereabouts in Colorado were you? Yeah, so I lived in Thornton, Colorado, which is the city okay. just north of, of Denver. And then I went to school in Golden, Colorado, a school called School of Mines, which is a great engineering school. I was always, yep, yeah. yeah, there I am. Uh, so the Ore Diggers, you know, we we were a great, we had a great soccer team. We were Division Two, but we had a great team. I really enjoyed my experience there. School was challenging, but made good friends, had a great time playing soccer. And I was able to get noticed by professional level scouts at that school and kind of launched myself into you know, a career in soccer. So nothing but great things to say about the city of Golden and the School of Mines, the ore diggers, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, before we hit the record button, I was telling you that, you know, given my time that I spent in Boulder, I love Golden. I, I just feel like it's one of those quintessential active towns. They've got, it's a walkable, bikeable, you know, sort of environment there. They've got the beautiful uh, bike path and a multi-use path along the river. Uh, just really tremendous. Now, what years were you there? I was there from 2010 through 2013, so I would have left okay. probably in January 2014. But yeah, you're right. Uh, and I, I, you know, urbanism was not even on my mind in, at the time I was in Golden, but I didn't have a car. I had my Esca legs, as I called it. So all I, all I could do was, was walk around. So I had to live close to the school. So I really did experience like the walkability of the city, but I never thought about it too much. Now looking back and visiting because my wife's family still lives in Golden, Okay. Um, I, I see like, wow, they have actually done a pretty good job here and, and they're actually doing better there. They're kind of upping the density around kind of, there's a really nice historic main street in Golden. They're kind of upping the density around that. Uh, like you said, there's like a bike and walk path, walk path that goes along the creek. So it's, it's a great small town. And I think just a great example of what a suburb could be really in yeah. the United States, I think. Yeah. And I'm glad you use that word suburb, too, because, you know, uh, for folks who may be driving through the golden area and they, they kind of you know make the, their way maybe from Denver or from Boulder and maybe even through Arvada or whatever, you'll see sort of, you know, your typical sort of single family homes and suburbs there. But as you mentioned, it's a very historic uh, town in the downtown Main Street area. And of course, Coors is, is one of the main employers of the area. And then, of course, there's the University of the College 
Colorado uh, School of Mines there. But uh, yeah, I mean, what a great opportunity because affordability is a challenge too in all of the Denver metro area. So building more denser homes and, and, and housing uh, within easy walking and biking distance to, to critical, you know, desirable destinations is really, really important. Yeah, 100%. And I think you always find, unfortunately, that the most walkable places in many cities are the most expensive. But I think that just speaks to the demand for walkability. You know, so I think we should kind of provide more of that, whether it be right in the city centers or in suburbs like Golden, kind of provide provide more pockets of walkability for people. And hopefully that should, you know, diffuse the the cost burden that is placed on each individual walkable place. And then as life would have it, uh, the next sort of thing that happened was you went to one of the most walkable, bikeable uh, cities. Oh, wait, uh, maybe not. What, what happened here? <laughs> yeah, I got, I got drafted to FC Dallas, uh, which was, you know, an amazing experience. I, I, it was a little bit out of nowhere. Like I knew I was a good soccer player and I was, I feel really lucky that I was able to get drafted, but yeah, Dallas and I kind of live North of the city in kind of Frisco Plano area not walkable at all. I mean, it's 20 minutes drive to get pretty much anywhere in Dallas. And most of that is like on a highway. So it's the opposite of walkability. Again, though, it, it wasn't even really walkability. Urbanism was not something that was on my radar at this point at all. Like I had grown up in a pretty car dependent place. I went to Dallas. It was car dependent. I just didn't, I just didn't think much of it. it I, I just accepted it as kind of like the reality of life. And I think, unfortunately, that's, that's just like the the case for most Americans, especially is it just seems so normal. It's like the fish being in water kind of thing. You know, like you don't, you don't think about like, what is like, what is the difference between being walkability and car centric because everything is so car centric. And so kind of, maybe I'm skipping forward, but one of my missions is just to kind of wake people up to the idea that, you know, this doesn't have to be this way. Not everything has to be so spread out and so car centric. So Dallas definitely in hindsight, you know, reinforced those beliefs in, in me for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then along, well, well let's stick with Dallas for just a moment because I, I do want to uh, point out that because you mentioned Plano, um, you know, Plano is actually accessible via train from the, the downtown metro uh, Dallas area. And fast forwarding to where you're at now, you're in Charlotte and, and you actually have a train transit and, and, and the light rail system is very much a prominent part about that. And we'll get to that later. But one of the things that I always cracks me up about the, uh, the Dallas area uh, transit is, yeah, you can get to Plano and you can get to some of these stops along the way. But I, I, it, it just absolutely blew me away how unfriendly some of those transit stops were. I actually shot some video one day. Uh, I was on my Brompton bike and, and I was like in a, you know, jump on the, uh, the, the train to go up to Plano and you couldn't actually get to the transit station unless you were in a car to get to the park and ride. I'm yeah. like, wait a minute. There's literally an apartment complex across the street from, from that particular transit stop, but there was no way for people to, to, to easily get from here to there. They had to walk way around to get to that spot. I just like, no, so I think, I think I literally went to that same one because at the time my wife used to work in downtown Dallas. So sometimes I would like hop on the train and meet her in downtown Dallas. But yeah, it's like a giant parking lot underneath the highway yeah. is where the the transit thing is and there, there's nobody walking like to or from it and so you know you could theoretically get from dallas to plano but then what you know there's there's not really anywhere to connect to or go to without a car so i think well that, the good thing like about really plano the, at least the plano stop the good thing about the plano stop is there's actually a right at that transit stop there's a there's an old historic depot there and you can walk to the downtown area that particular stop was pretty good it was one of the other suburban stops that was just mind-boggling i'm like what are you doing <laughs> yeah 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 you see it a little bit too often that's for sure yeah yeah and then something else happened. So, so in professional athletics, sometimes you get traded. And so you got traded to Orlando. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the trade was actually like a very good thing for me. Um, I was in Orlando for five years, which is a long time in the, for a professional athlete to be in one place. 
And we kind of amicably, amicably decided like, maybe it's better if I get traded. Both sides agreed. Even before they traded me to Orlando, they called and said, is Orlando a place that you'd be interested in going? I said, yeah, it is. So ended up in Orlando. This picture that we're looking at here is actually my first game in Orlando. I scored a goal and I had just had a son, my first son, maybe two, maybe two, a month before this. And so my son was at the game. And so it was just, just that's a really actually amazing moment in my life that we're seeing pictured here. And then the point is every, every goal I scored as a pro professional, I would always like kiss my ring and point up at my wife. So pointing at my wife and my son up there, scored my first goal in my first game in Orlando, just a, a great experience for sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. And and, and again, Orlando, a number, another one of those cities that depending on which neighborhood you're in could be incredibly card dependent. Yeah, definitely. And so Orlando is, is kind of the genesis of when I started waking up to the, the ideas of walkability. I actually lived in a suburb called Winter Park, which is a suburb, but it, it was a nice neighborhood. And Winter Park actually had kind of one of those historic downtown streets with shops and it was walkable. There was a train stop there. Yeah, so you can see me here pictured with um, the Orlando Yimby co-founder, Austin Valley, who he was really the person who started waking me up to these ideas. Um, I, I started, I kind of stumbled into an Orlando Yimby meeting and ended up having a conversation with him. And that that was probably like the first domino to fall, I would say, in terms of like bringing me to, to where I am now as like a full-blown <laughs> urbanist and real estate developer. So... Uh, yeah, Austin is a great guy. He's still in Orlando, like really pushing for more walkability, bikeability, transit access in the city. So a, a great person to know if anybody's in and around Orlando. Yeah. And and so th talk a little bit about that transition. I mean, it's I'm always fascinated by this when people from that don't have formal training in this arena, uh, you know, city planners and urbanists and, and transportation uh, officials and all that, when they sort of start drinking the Kool-Aid of, of urbanism and, you know, you start getting these these acronyms of NIMBY and YIMBY and all the uh, talk a little bit about that sort of awakening of, oh, wow. This is interesting. Yeah. So I guess on the else I didn't mention this picture. So that, that is like right there on that kind of historic area of Winter Park. So there's some there's some nice urbanism going on. You can see the brick street, some nice like density. So it's great. Um, so what happened was Austin introduced me to a developer in Orlando called Craig Usler, who's he's known as Mr. Downtown. And, and he is also like a self-proclaimed urbanist. He was actually at CNU this year as well, like we were. And so I, I met with him and started talking about this stuff. And he said, you should read the book, Walkable City. And so I read that book and I was like, boom, this is like, this is it. You know, for example, like years and years early, or a few years earlier, I had gone to Amsterdam, loved Amsterdam, but I didn't have the words for why. And I was like, Walkable City is giving me the words for why. So when you talk about like being an outsider, getting exposed, I think just those, those books, like Walkable City is good information, but it's so easy to read. It's so easy to understand. You know, he's not like bogging you down in the details, which the details are very important. But I think in terms of like waking up the general population to these ideas, I think it's just about like the bullet points. Like think about where's your favorite neighborhood in your city? Guaranteed it's a walkable neighborhood. You know, where's your place that you like to go vacation? I guarantee it's walkable. Why did you have such a good time in Europe? Because you could walk and bike and ride the train everywhere. You know, and I think like just just those triggering words, which Walkable City really was that for me, is so important in taking someone like me who was a professional soccer player, had no training, never thought about walkability at all, taking me from there to becoming now where <laughs> this is pretty much all that I think about. And it's, it's just those those little intros. Um, walk, walkable City is, is a, a great first step. And I think a lot of people probably listening to this would would agree and share that experience. Yeah. And I think Jeff knows this, this story, right? Je Jeff Speck uh, understands that, you know, his, and when you say triggering, you mean triggering in a good way. <laughs> oh yeah. The, no, the best way. Yeah. Like triggered me to kind of wake up. He does know. And actually at this year's CNU in Charlotte, I was able to uh, grab lunch with him, which was amazing. I even like, I called my mom after because she knew how much this book like meant to me. And just the fact that it was a real full circle moment for me to be like having lunch with the guy who, who again was one of those real people who, triggered me in a good way to, to like kind of wake up and, and think about the world in a little bit different way. And, and talk a little bit about that. You, you mentioned your mom, you know, she, she understands your passion for this and how impactful that book was. 
uh, and, and, and you're coming about, you're coming to this world from the outside. Talk a little bit about, you know, that from, you know, for, for people who are listening to this, watching this, get passionate about, yeah, I, I want my mom to kind of know and, and, and others. In other words, how do we break outside of uh, our, our echo chambers and our bubbles to be able to start to permeate and, and be able to bring more Teshos in? Yeah, I think the thing is just to, you know, basically start with your mom, like just start with the people, you know, talking about it. So in my personal example, like my mom is just a very like strong environmentalist person. She does everything possible to she like composting, recycling, all, all of this stuff. But the idea of urbanism and walkability was not even on her radar. So when I approached her with these ideas, I approached it in the sense of look at how great this is for the environment, you know? And that, that's, that's what I love about it is you can come to somebody like my mom who the environment is like her number one passion and kind of like interest in, in life basically. And so I can come to her with urbanism through an environmental lens, but I can come to somebody else who maybe is like, let's say a fiscal conservative and you can come like urbanism through a fiscal conservative lens and you can, it's the same, it's the same thing, but you can give everybody what they want that's what I love about it. So I would say, you know, just try to dial it down. You know, if you're trying to like spread the words to more test shows, to more people who haven't thought about this, think about what's important to them and try to connect it back to urbanism. Because I, I've found it really does connect to so many different things. You said it, you come at it from kind of a health point of view. You know, a lot of people, especially now, there's the sauna, the cold plunge, all the, the you know, health influencers that are going on right now. What about walking 15 minutes per day just to, to get around a little bit more like in the health benefits of that or, or seeing uh, your neighbors more often and the mental health benefits of that mental health is another big thing. So I, I think just just start small and talk to the people by you. So I, I think is, is and also like talk to them in language that is familiar to them. I, one thing I found in this is that, you know, the architects, the planners, the engineers, are very deep in the details, which is important to push things forward. But sometimes that turns off the general public to to being open to these ideas because they're just getting bogged down with stats and whatever it is, graphics, all this stuff. Instead, just say, wouldn't it be nice if you could walk to the coffee shop this morning? You know, like that would be nice, you know, like, and that's where you approach people or, oh, you're really passionate about the environment. Like, did you know that being in a more walkable neighborhood lowers your carbon impact on the world by a lot. Boom, they're triggered I, in, in a good way to, to start thinking about these things. And then you hand them walkable city and then the dominoes start falling. So I think just use language that people can, can understand that that's, I kind of can't overstate how important that is. Yeah. I really appreciate too, your example of, you know, like if somebody is approaching things, their, their worldviews, like from a fiscal conservative perspective, uh, even going back to my original career, as, as we mentioned before, I, I hit, we hit the record button, you know, I was all about public health, but it was in the context of healthcare cost containment. In other words, it really was about being fiscally conservative and preventing things from happening so that we, we, you know, are, are, are not burning money, <laughs> which a lot of people don't realize that uh, large corporations are self-insured. And so they have a, f uh, a fiscal responsibility and a an incentive to try to prevent every single heart attack that happens, every single high blood pressure, every single cancer. And so they, they have a vested interest to try to create healthier environments for their employees. And, um, and that's why I had a 15 year career doing that. And uh, to your point is understanding your audience and understanding what is something that is, you know, relevant to their world. And I also appreciate the fact that you said, tone it down a little bit. <laughs> we can get, we can get excited uh, about stuff and, and people will be like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah. No, I think like so, seeing you, for example, is the time to nerd out on the details yeah. and like really pushing the envelope forward. But if you're talking to your neighbor, Tone, tone it down a little bit. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I, that's what I find. Like a lot of people are deep into the details and kind of wondering why isn't this message landing? My, my advice is tone it down a little bit. And I think I'm actually in a great position because I have not spent as much time as, for example, you thinking about these issues and like really getting ingrained in it. You're, you are a great communicator, but the, so what I've had to do is take the deep, the, the high end details, try to understand it for myself and pass it along so I'm almost like dumbing it down for myself to understand and then just like spitting out that plain English version to 
know, whether it's my mom or people who follow me on social media. And that's really been my strategy for, for spreading the message is just, or even um, just showing pictures of like beautiful buildings or beautiful neighborhoods, stuff like that, that it's just kind of wakes people up to the idea of, oh yeah, that is a cool neighborhood. Why is why is that a cool neighborhood? You know, just, just waking people up through really simple um, easy to understand ways. And there, and there's opportunities to come together. Like you mentioned CNU, that's a great opportunity. Was that your f- first Congress? It was. I felt so lucky because, yes. you know, when I was playing pro soccer, there's no way I could take a few days off to go yeah. to like an urbanism conference. But the fact that I retired, I moved to Charlotte and then the first CNU or the CNU was there that year. I think it was the first time I was in Charlotte. Strong Towns was there for the first time. So all these conferences came to the city that I'm now really passionate about kind of pushing forward. Uh, I, I felt like it was it was almost destiny in some sense. It felt really great. Yeah. So that's an opportunity to, to nerd out and other opportunities to nerd out or is, you know, kind of finding your tribe and, and coming together. Talk a little bit about uh, these, this series of photos here. Yeah. So that was my last Orlando Yimby meeting. Actually, uh, Orlando Yimby played a really important part in, like I said, I met Austin there and kind of started pushing these ideas forward in my mind, but the, it was a great group. And it's just, it's a group of people who are everyday people. I don't think maybe like one or two people in the, in that photo might be like professionals in the industry, but Austin, for example, he works for Disney, you know, uh, I think there's, there's another girl there, Hannah, that works for Disney. Uh, it's just, <clears throat> just everyday people who want to see their neighborhood be more affordable, more transit, bike, walk connected. And we would just get together, you know, once a month or once every other month and just kind of talk about these, these things the group's growing. They started a book club as I was leaving. And I think like these types of groups are actually extremely important as well. So Charlotte has a group called the Charlotte Urbanists, which is kind of the corollary to the Orlando Yimby group. And they meet every single Saturday at the same time. And I think it's really important because say I'm somebody in Charlotte who gets interested in these ideas. It's like, I want to talk about this. Who do I talk to? And if you find like, oh, there's people meeting Saturday that I can like talk to about this. I think that's really important. And so like if you are, you know, wherever, let's say Atlanta or Nashville, which is a nearby city and you're really interested in this stuff, I would encourage you to either join a group of people who are doing these types of in-person meetings consistently or start one yourself, because I think that's really how movements grow and that those in-person connections are are super valuable to push the movement forwards, but also just valuable for just finding your tribe, you know, finding people who who are kind of thinking the same things as you. And we, we had we had a great time. So. That was a that was a send off meeting for me in a way in this picture and uh, just kind of like the start of the next generation for Orlando EMB, which they're doing great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that uh, that storyline, um, you know, the origin story, meeting Austin and then uh, connecting with this group. And I think that is a, a, a lesson, too, in addition to, you know, toning it down a little bit and, and having these conversations with your family and friends, it's then it's also, you know, if it kind of like the light bulb and the curiosity sort of gets off is, well, you know, come, come join me for the next, you know, Yimby meeting or the next CNU chapter meeting or something like that. Honest, it's, it's not a cult, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's, it, in other words, it's approachable and it's welcoming. And, and, and hopefully if we're doing our jobs well as advocates and activists, um, we're, we're also welcoming, uh, a, a diverse, you know, suite of people and welcoming people into the fold. Yeah. And I think even kind of the message of Yimby is just more affordable housing. You know, there, there's like the legalized housing t-shirt, which is a very catchy thing, kind of gets people's attention, but everybody can connect to the message of, wouldn't you like it to be more affordable to live in great neighborhoods? Everybody can connect to that. You know, so right. I think that's why it's, a, it's such a powerful message. It's simple, it's easy to connect to. And I, I think it just kind of brings people into the door. And that that's a wide umbrella, especially in times like right now in the world where things are very often like fragmented based on, whatever it may be, politics or your social status or something like that. This is a wide umbrella that I think we're able to cast here. And just wouldn't it be better to be more affordable housing, better for the environment? All of these things, like most people can agree is is a good thing. So I think we have a really huge potential to pull together, like you said, a, a diverse group of people from all over the country, all over the city, et cetera, to, to kind of push these ideas forward. 
Yeah, yeah. And I'll zoom in on this here so we can, uh, you know, kind of do a couple of different things. You, you mentioned the T-shirt, uh, legalize housing. Uh, we also uh, uh, mentioned a couple of different acronyms, uh, one in YIMBY and also NIMBY. Uh, why don't you, uh, since we do have a, a, a rather global audience listening and tuning in and, and watching uh, this episode, uh, why don't you go ahead and define what YIMBY and NIMBY means? Yeah, so I think NIMBY came first, so I'll start there. So NIMBY stands for Not In My Backyard, and it's people who just generally oppose housing uh, being built in their neighborhoods for for this or that reason. It's interesting because, you know, the NIMBY movement comes from a, a, also a, a very interesting groups of people. There's there's people who are coming at it from an affordability standpoint, some people are coming out at it saying, no, new housing will bring traffic, or some people say new housing will bring crime. So there's there's lots of reasons people are opposed to housing that they claim to be. Um, so NIMBY is people who are fighting <laughs> new development, new progress in their neighborhoods for you know a variety of reasons. Then the YIMBY movement came along, which stands for yes in my backyard. And YIMBY is, is kind of the counterbalance. They're saying, we do want more housing in this neighborhood. You, you know, like for me in, in Charlotte, I live in a wonderful neighborhood called Noda and they're building a ton of apartments. And I love that. Like I, I, I love my neighborhood and I want a ton of people to be able to experience that neighborhood. And I want like those people to bring their kids and their families and their life to that neighborhood and be able to like interact with me and my kids and my family. I think it just kind of is amazing. So I'm, I'm, you know, self-proclaimed Yimby. Yes. In my backyard, I would love, you know, more density, more, whether it's restaurants or whatever it may be, actually literally, you know, in my backyard, in my neighborhood, in my city, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, your neighborhood of Noda, which uh, stands for uh, the North Davidson area. It's a historic mill area there in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and I do have a, a wonderful video, a bike ride video of many of the uh, developments up in that area. And I think it was uh, actually called the um, Reinventing the Front Porch uh, Bike Tour, uh, which was part of CNU. And uh, so we were looking at some of the developments, mostly the commercial developments developments, which were in some of the old mill houses that uh, are right along uh, Davidson there and and how they're getting a new life, you know, a new lease on life in terms of restaurants and, and retail shops and and creating that uh, that welcoming front porch environment, which is so historic to uh, that area, you know, because, you know, that's where people would come together would be to catch the evening breeze, you know, uh, on the front porch. And so it became a social gathering place. So very much a part of, of your neighborhood is that concept of coming together uh, as a society, as a, as a neighborhood. Yeah, the front porch is an extremely important part of, you know, North Davidson Street, the Noda neighborhood. Uh, if you go along North Davidson Street, like you said, you'll see a lot of these houses with front porches that have been turned into restaurants, tattoo parlors, etc. But then even within the neighborhood, there's front porches. And, you know, I'll be walking my kids around in the stroller or with their scooters. And my neighbors are on their front porch, you know, saying hi to us. Yeah, it, it was super, super fun. Now, that was my first visit to Charlotte. So it was neat to be able to experience CNU, uh, which I, I, I give I have to give a shout out to the organization CNU and the Congress for the New Urbanism. Uh, oftentimes, uh, it's cities that I wouldn't have visited otherwise. Uh, like last year, it was Oklahoma City just up the road from me here. And it was wonderful to be able to uh, to to jump in, jump in the car, do a road trip up to Oklahoma City and see Oklahoma City. And earlier we were mentioning Jeff Speck with Walkable City. You know, that's one of his cities. You know, he did a lot to, to help redefine uh, what Oklahoma City looked like. So it was wonderful to see that. And it was super, super cool to, to check out um, you know, Charlotte, North Carolina and, and be able to see your neighborhood. So, yeah, good Right, right timing. Good timing there. You know, you just move there. You're you're getting yeah. all settled in, and boom, seeing you happens. Uh, but yeah. earlier, you had mentioned s social media a little bit, and so so talk about that transition. And uh, you know, so you've you've sort of gone down the rabbit hole. You you had, you drank the Kool Aid, and, uh, and and then where does social media and where does Twitter come in and in, in through all of this? Yeah, so kind of in the last year of my career, I decided, um, you know, I, I've 
a bunch of interesting thoughts. I thought, I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking a lot of stuff and I'm doing a lot of stuff off the field, but many people don't know about it. So I started to decide, you know, I'm going to put myself out there a little bit. And initially that was talking about personal finance, education, affordable housing, uh, real estate investing, et cetera. And, oh, wait a minute. You know, Is that where we have the, the your head exploding? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's where we have the, the exploding head. That's a good picture to come Boom. to. Boom. Yeah. There we go. So, it's all, yeah, it's, so, it's got to get out. <laughs> yeah. So the Genesis, and actually this this graphic here was created by an Orlando City fan, Marima. She's, uh, you can see her name kind of beside my neck there. But yeah. um, so this was kind of the Genesis. I was talking about all this stuff on Twitter, posting it. Then I started doing Twitter spaces every week. Um, I would just... I would just hop on and say whoever wants to talk. And sometimes it would be open conversations. I might have a guest. I might just, you could call up people from the crowd, which was really cool. So I got to actually interact with the Orlando City fans a little bit more one-on-one -on -one through that experience, which was great. Uh, you know, those conversations and just me posting on social media pushed me in the direction of urbanism, walkability. And then, then my Twitter just kind of completely changed to like, all right, now all I want to talk about is like cool neighborhoods, urbanism, walkability. And so, you know, what you're seeing here, this Society Hill is at the time I was still playing for Orlando City. So we would go play Philadelphia Union, for example. And it's cool because we get to, we get to travel to all these great American cities and stay in some of the best neighborhoods. So we stayed downtown Philadelphia and I would go for a long walk uh, the, the night we would get in and just find a cool neighborhood and, you know, take pictures and post it. Uh, that was actually a tip I got from Craig Usler, who was the uh, developer in Orlando I met, was he was like, as you're traveling around, this is a great opportunity to go to these different neighborhoods. You're still trying to learn. So walk around and say, what do I like about this neighborhood? What don't I like? What makes this place great? What doesn't? This one that we're seeing here in Charlotte is something new that I've, actually, I've been trying to do is post examples of almost single family home type developments that are still dense. Because, you know, I, th I think this is actually an important point and something that's kind of, you know, brewing in my mind right now is a lot of the urbanist movement is, you know, we, we talk about density, which is, which is important, but we usually frame it through, let's say, a fourplex, a duplex, all of these types of things, which a lot of Americans have the American dream, single family house. And so, like, the fact that you're connecting density to apartment buildings or duplexes, they're immediately turned off. So I've started thinking about how can you show people density that looks different? And, you know, I think this is a great example of, I'm sure almost anybody who would live in any single family house would live in this development right here. It's beautiful, well-designed, but, but I mean, look at it. The, I think there's maybe 18 houses on 1.4 acres or something like that. That's, that's enough density to, to create a nice walkable neighborhood right there. So I think this type of development actually plays a really key role in somewhere like Charlotte, which is, you know, known for its sprawl, you're not just going to put apartments, you know, Charlotte's not going to turn into Manhattan tomorrow. So how can we start moving it forward? I think it's more of these type of almost pocket neighborhoods of density, uh, where you just have a few houses within an acre. It's still beautiful. I think you, you get a different type of consumer for these types of products than you may get for, um, you know, just like a traditional apartment complex or a fourplex. And yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to highlight these. Another, another thing, so this, this is Camp North End actually. So this, this is jumping forward again, a little bit into um, what I'm doing now. So Camp North End is a 76 acre. We, we took, it's a historic like adaptive reuse and ground up development project. So there was 1.5 million square feet of, you know, almost abandoned uh, industrial space basically. We turned that into class A office space and restaurants, and then we're building about 2,000 apartments on the site. And this is one mile away from the heart of Charlotte, North Carolina. So it's connected, it's walkable. And, you know, I said at the beginning, my goal is to build better neighborhoods. So the fact that I was able to jump into this new career and work on a project here like Camp North End has been, you know, a, a real blessing for me, for sure. Yeah. And you mentioned only one mile from really the heart of, of, of Charlotte. And uh, one of the things that I was just really impressed with was also the build out of the bike network. So you've got two, you get two things that are happening here simultaneously is you, if you do have the, the transit system that is, is in place. And so you have a rail transit line. I think if the history, my history is right, I think that they 
got that transit line from money that Orlando didn't use. Yes, <laughs> and yes, they were able yes. to build out their transit line. <laughs> and so they have rail transit with some serving some amazing neighborhoods, but they also have the build out of the, the bicycle network, which is a combination of um, off street network of pathways that are following uh, some wonderful green greenways and, and spaces. But then you also have a burgeoning protected and separated on street network of, of, of lanes that are coming in. And I found it very, very, uh, I was surprised to, to, to begin with. I mean, I had heard notoriously about the amount of sprawl that exists in the Charlotte area, um, over 300 square miles, I believe of, of actual city land, but then just, it, it, it was inherently, uh, the distances were quite doable, you know, within, you know, being able to get to some of these meaningful destinations. So it's great to hear that this particular site is going to be, you know, from a distance perspective, very reachable. Now, is this also accessible from any of the main transit lines? It's, it's, a, it's a decent walkway. I think it's like a mile walk or so to the, the closest uh, transit station. There's plans for the city. Actually, if you see on the, that map, there's like a big kind of dark slash between those red buildings on the right-hand mm-hmm. side. Right, yeah. So the city hopes one day to bring the red line, which would be a future expansion of our light rail system, right through there. That's uh-huh. actually a, a railroad, abandoned railroad from Norfolk Southern right now. So it's not our land. It sits there. It's an easement right through the middle of our property. The city uh, and the state actually are negotiating with Norfolk Southern on like kind of giving up their easement there. So one day maybe there could be a transit connection literally through the middle of our project, which would be a dream come true. But uh, right now it's about a mile walk to the transit, but it's also, you know, a mile walk or so to the heart of downtown. So and on a bike, it's it's even easier than that. That's a piece of cake. I mean, that's one of the things that I try to really emphasize on the Active Towns channel is that since we're not talking about proximities and densities that are European stand, standards or, or even like standards of like Philadelphia or, you know, the core of D.C., we're, we're looking at distances that are a little longer, but they're perfectly bikeable. These are perfectly bikeable distances. Even in the heat of summer, you know, I I can jump on my bike and ride the almost two miles to Whole Foods to do my grocery shopping, even when it's 170 degrees out here. You know, it's like I've got a little electric assist bike. I can get up and down the hills. It, the, the breeze is fine, even during hot, humid conditions. And so that's one of the things to keep in mind is that if you really want to open up the uh, possibilities for developments like this is, OK, we don't have that transit stop yet, but do we have bikeability? Do we have a corridor where we can have a separated path? Do we have the ability to create a protected bike lane through, um, you know, this area so that, you know, hey, that one mile to get to the transit to get to a different location, piece of cake. We can easily do that. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, you were saying earlier that you were in Charlotte and you were kind of surprised at the, the bike network you saw. I think it's it's almost our duty as urbanists to highlight good examples that are already happening in our cities and are, are and have been done. It is very easy to kind of complain about the city's not doing enough, that Charlotte is too sprawled out, et cetera, et cetera, which is true. But there's also a ton of great examples in Charlotte right now of great walkability, great bikeability, the, the bike networks, there's a rail, there's a you know, a light rail going right through the city. There are great examples of all these ideals in play. And I think we should maybe think about doing a little bit more to highlight the positive instead of constantly, you know, fighting against the negative. I think people like to support positive messaging. And so I think if you, if you keep showing people, Hey, you're in Charlotte, don't you like these few neighborhoods? Yes. Wouldn't we, shouldn't we build some more (laughs) neighborhoods like this? And I think that's where you start, you know, like I live in Noda, there's Plaza Midwood, for example, South End, that are great little pockets kind of close into the city. Can we just kind of start pushing and expanding the borders of that walkability outwards? You don't need to start in the far flung corners of Charlotte to, to you know, fix the city. It's you, you take those positive examples. And I think I think, again, in the same way that I was saying, kind of tone things down a little bit. I think that we also need to cheer things up a little bit and and put more of a positive spin on things. You know, we the, the U.S. is not perfect. But there's there's good stuff happening. And I think if we kind of 
if we if we keep our tone positive, I think it, it's easier for people to to join the movement. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was like a, a pitch for, for Active Town's uh, YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no I, exactly. And yeah. I think when, when we talked at, at CNU, that's why we, we resonated so much is because we both kind of had that, that positive outlook on the situation is, look, everybody, everybody wants change and change. There's a bunch of ways to go about it. My way is to just kind of highlight positivity and lean into that and kind of get people pushing for those more, po- like you, you're seeing here on the right hand side, this is Camp North End everything you're seeing was an abandoned industrial site, you know, just a few years ago. And look at it now. There's, re- there's shops, there's, these are offices. Uh, we actually we have an e-bike rental kind of place here at Camp North End. There's this plant shop. All of this stuff is, is happening in a place that, um, you know, was formerly just very industrial only kind of office place. So it's possible to create change. We're doing it here and people are doing it all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm only half joking about, uh, that being a wonderful pitch for, for the active towns channel really is. I mean, uh, I, obviously I produce this podcast, uh, every one episode per week. Uh, I'm producing anywhere between two and three, sometimes even four additional, uh, videos per week of doing just that, trying to profile, uh, positive things that are happening globally. So, um, I have the good fortune of being able to travel internationally as well as around the country to try to profile the people, places, and programs that are helping to create a culture of activity and, and bring walkability and bikeability and the ability to, you know, counter what is, you know, sort of a, a devious sort of insidious car centric car dependency. So there's, there is that opportunity to do it. So I really appreciate you saying, you know, and pointing that out that we need to do better at storytelling. And that's, that's my core mission with the active tense channel is to tell those stories. So yeah, we're, we're looking at some pretty vibrant stuff, um, you know, here. And again, you know, really core to the urbanism mantra of, you know, hey, it's got to be able to be, you know, you got that, that work, the play, the learn, the stay. It, it's all trying to, to talk about that fact of, you know, do we have meaningful destinations within walking and biking distance to, to where we're living? Yeah, 100%. And we're, you know, here at Camp North and we're trying to kind of create the cultural hub for Charlotte. So we want to be the place where if you're an artist, where do the artists meet up? They meet up at Camp North End. If you're an, an athlete, want to watch a sports game, where do they meet up? Camp North End. You know, if you're uh, if you're trying to work out, where like we have a run group that meets here every Tuesday. Six hundred people every single Tuesday. It's it's insane. Wait, it's wait a minute. Mad Six Miles, hundred Mad, people. Yeah, Mad Miles Run Group. Uh, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, you guys will have to check it out on their Instagram. Is you can see the videos because. It's, it's insane, about 600 people every single week. So it's like, if you're into running, where you come, you come to Kent North End. We want to be kind of that cultural hub for Charlotte, uh, creating those those amazing experiences. And, you know, with 76 acres of space that is kind of under our control, we really have the chance to do some amazing things. We also have here on our team, we have a community team who kind of curates and manages those types of events and makes sure that there's always something interesting and cool happening here. Um, so yeah, it's important. Yeah, there, and there you can see kind of the, the proximity. So Camp North End is every, basically the little triangle that you see in the, the foreground, and then in the background is is the city. So you just literally take the road on the left-hand side, that's Graham Street, that goes straight into the middle of Charlotte, you know, less than a, a mile walk or bike ride away. Yeah. Something I, I guess also before we move on is, a, you know, we were in the, the tabs you saw, work, play, stay, learn. And a lot of times in urbanism, we actually talk a lot about, I would say, the live and play. We talk a lot about the housing and we talk about, like, you know, coffee shop type of things. But we don't talk much about offices, right? And like how offices are, people spend eight hours a day at the office a lot of time. Maybe, you know, that's something that we need to talk a little bit more about is bringing, you know, office space into these walkable communities. Even where I live in Noda, it's an amazing neighborhood. There's, you know, a bunch of housing there. There's a bunch of restaurants and stuff there. There's no offices there, you know? So it's kind of like, it's, it's not fully integrated in the, the Jane Jacobs style of, of like different uses in the same place. So there, you know, there you see some of the office space that we have kind of built in to Camp North End, you you know, so on the outside, we have the run clubs going on and we have all of the, you know, the shops and the restaurants, but there's also a ton of office space here at Camp North End where, we have some tenants that have already moved in and, you know, looking to get more, but 
I think that's also a really important part of uh, walkability, walkable neighborhoods, transit connectedness in terms of like where are you going to? A lot of the place that people are going to is to an office. So if you have the offices way out, but the the live and the play in one place, it, it doesn't really work. You need all of it kind of together to make. Yeah, yeah. I'm really glad you mentioned that too, because I think that that's one of the most critical decisions that if somebody's relocating, they're, you know, they're like, okay, my, my professional soccer playing career is done in Orlando. I want to move to Charlotte. And it's like, okay, where, where do I put down roots? Where do I, you know, uh, move and establish my family? Do I want to do it, you know, over here? And then, but way over there is where the office is. And, and I'm, I, I'm committing myself to this long, you know, commute. And I'm glad that you mentioned, you know, there's this integration of making sure that you don't forget about office space and, and space to be able for corporates, uh, you know, corporate headquarters, you know, businesses to, to establish a place that's near meaningful destinations, near restaurants, near housing. And, and making it, enabling it, making it legal, <laughs> legalizing the ability for people to have housing near where their artist studio is, where the work is, where the play is. That's, that's why we, we put those words together and those tabs together in that way, is we mean it. We, we, we do want to see people uh, having that option, that choice of being able to live near where they work, near where they play. Yeah, I think it's also another way to just kind of extend that umbrella. You know, if you have office space within a walkable neighborhood or say someone has office space here at Camp North End, they they probably arrive by car right now, which is, you know, the typical way and someone in Charlotte gets to work. But then you're here and you say, where do we go to lunch? Oh, we could just we could walk over here to lunch. Oh, after lunch, we got the farmer's market. Let's walk to the farmer's market. Oh, and you start getting like a little bit of walkability kind of introduced into your life. I think, you know, that's another way that you just kind of through experience, storytelling, et cetera, can kind of can expand that umbrella and get more people who maybe haven't thought about, you know, the importance of walkability can kind of get them on our team as it is. Yeah. And going back to the overhead uh, view here, too, is like, you know, so, you know, maybe somebody is going to work for an organization that has set up in, you know, office space, you know, here at Camp North End and, uh, you know, their, their lease comes up and they happen to live, you know, on the other side of town. And yet there's a really cool place that, you know, within walking distance that has just come up or, uh, a new apartment. Well, we're also complex. building 2000 apartments at Camp North End. So we're Boom. under construction right now on our first 300. Those will be finished next year. And then we're going to start construction on the next 300 you know, at the beginning of next year. So it, we're going to uh, keep building apartments. There should be about 2000 apartments at the end of the day, kind of here within, within what you see on this picture. Yeah. Yeah. And we talked about affordability earlier. And the reason why legalized housing is one of those mantras that we have out there is that if we legalize being able to build high quality housing uh, stock uh, of different types, just like you said, you, even some of those, you know, creative uh, types of, of, of housing, uh, you know, that, that you were talking about earlier, you know, th this, this gives more choice, more options. And uh, if we can get that attractive, desirable housing within walking and biking distance to more desirable places, uh, you know, hopefully we can just kind of break that car addiction of, or feeling like there's no other choice. We have to drive. You mentioned it earlier. Maybe they're driving now, but if you know that, the, that little bit of taste of walkability, Oh, we'll walk to the, the lunch spot or, Oh, by the way, did you know we can ride our bikes from here to downtown really easily? It's short, you know, distance, proximity, et cetera. It, it, it's that little taste of, Oh, Maybe, you know, it's a positive success story that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, for sure. And even, I, you know, I'm not sure the exact stats, but it's something like, let's say 90% of trips made by Americans are done by car. So even if we just, if they drive to work, but their lunch break, they're always going to by foot, 
that's a huge reduction in like vehicle miles traveled for most people. Whereas most people are driving to work and then driving to lunch, driving back to work, driving home, et cetera. So even if you can just take out a few of those car trips, I think it's significant. You know, we don't need to go from a country where 90% of trips are by car to a country where 10% of trips are by car. That's not going to happen overnight. I think it's, it's significant to move from 90% to 75%. That's a huge change, you know, and then, and then from once you're at, you're in a world where 75% is achievable, you 50% is on the horizon and you, you know, you kind of keep moving in that direction where it, it's, it's just kind of inevitable, you know? So I, I think we also can't overlook the importance of just taking out one or two trips or just, just moving that number slightly in the right direction is, is also really powerful. Yeah. And when we, when you do look at the data of what the trips are like and the distances that we're traveling when we're in an automobile in North America, on average, about 40 to 50% of all trips are within easy biking distance. And you, and you let that sink in and you're like, oh, wow, you mean 40 to 50 percent of trips are within easy, reasonable biking distance. And that's not even doing the overlay of if you have an electric assist bike. It's like, oh, wow, the opportunities are there. Then you look at the Dutch and you and you look at, you know, Amsterdam, you had mentioned Amsterdam earlier. You look at the Dutch model and you see it's not like, you know. 70% of, of people there, um, you know, are only riding a bike. It's like they actually, actually have mode balance in the sense that about 30% of people, you know, kind of get to work or whatever by car. 30% is by public transit and about 30%, you know, on average across the entire nation is, is getting around by walking and biking. And so you, you have that. And some denser areas, you know, like in Utrecht, it may be skewed a little bit one way or the other. And maybe you have, you know, closer to 40 to 50 to 60 percent getting around by bike. Um, but your point is, and the point is, is that even just slight modal shifts, getting out of those inherently bikeable distances instead of, you know, four miles that four mile trip uh, to, to, you know, the restaurant or to downtown or whatever, if it's on a bikeable route, hey, let's, let's go for a bike ride. It's a beautiful day. We've got electric assist. If it's a little warm, we'll, we'll show up in good condition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and I think, you know, like that modal balance is actually a really important um, talking point when, let's say, talking to people who haven't thought about this much, because if you tell people, you know what, you need to stop driving your car today and like never drive your car again. A lot of people are, that's just going to shut them off. But if you say, like you said, Hey, you know, aren't a few of those trips like in pretty easy, uh, walking or biking distance for you, maybe you can get them kind of opening their mind up. And I, I think that's kind of a more um, palatable message for a lot of people. And, and it, again, it just broadens the umbrella, gets more people on our side moving this, this forward. So I think understanding like modal balance and presenting the message that way is also really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you had mentioned it earlier, you know, telling the positive stories and, you know, and, and really honing in on the joy of being able to get to meaningful destinations under your own power and not feeling like, oh, we have to get back in the car, especially if you, you, you do have to commute, you know, by car, you know, maybe the distances are truly, you know, un, you know, unattainable through transit and, and by walking and biking, maybe when you get home, the last thing in the world that you want to do is get back in a car to be able to do something. You'd much rather be able to jump on the transit line, you know, and, and ride the train into downtown, uh, jump on your bike and be able to, you know, to, to go out uh, for the evening. Uh, I was staying in an Airbnb uh, along the, um, the, the south end, uh, along the trail line, you know, the, the rail line, the rail, there, trail. Yep. And the rail trail. And, and it was just absolutely wonderful for me to be filming and documenting uh, the, the young professionals that are just thriving in this environment because they're able to walk and bike to so many cool places. It was really, really a, a neat thing to see. Yeah. No, and like I said, you know, Charlotte, a city that is not really known for this does have a lot of, a lot of this going on. There's a lot of walkability in, especially in certain neighborhoods in Charlotte. And I, I found that very true of, of every city, honestly, like you mentioned Oklahoma city earlier, you know, I, I was, I was traveling around the country when I was playing soccer, every single city I went to, even like Columbus, Ohio, for example, for example, or Cincinnati, 
you know, these might be places that you think, oh, it, it's, it can't be walkable urbanist. No, there are places like that in all of these cities that are just beautiful neighborhoods with a ton of walkability, bikeability, you know, like live, work, play all mixed into one. So it is happening all over the place. And, and the, another thing you mentioned is, uh, you know, the young professionals. So another kind of thing that I'm, you know, working on is we have done in this country a decent job of providing walkability to young professionals. We have not done such a good job, I think, of providing it to families. Families' needs are often very different. What What is a walkable neighborhood to a family is also different than, like, where do I go? I go to my kid's daycare every single day, and I go to the park every single day. You know, like a young professional, they don't need to be in the same neighborhood as that, maybe. So just, like, understanding how can we you know, build in more family friendliness into our neighborhoods and make sure that families don't feel like, okay, in my young professional stage, whatever, 20 to 27, I'm in South End, but then I have to move out, you know, way out into the suburbs. How can we kind of keep people through different stages of their lives in in the city in more walkable neighborhoods, I think is also an important conversation and discussion. Yeah. Yeah. And you just mentioned Cincinnati, which, of course, is uh, the destination uh, next year for uh, the CNU gathering. Uh, So CNU 32 will be in Cincinnati. And again, to my point uh, earlier, I've never been to Cincinnati, so it'll give me an opportunity to visit. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. If, if anybody goes on my Twitter, I went to the over the Rhine neighborhood in Cincinnati and it's beautiful. There's some beautiful like buildings, old buildings. It's very walkable neighborhood. So I think, you know, the same way a lot of people I talked to at this CNU were pleasantly surprised with Charlotte. I think you'll find the same thing in Cincinnati. Tasha, what have we not mentioned uh, that you want to make sure we leave the audience with? I think so. Okay. One thing I would say is I'm a, re- I'm a real estate developer. I work for a real estate developer now. A lot I have found that there is, sometimes is a disconnect between the urbanists and the developers, but we need, we need to be on the same team. You know, like if you want to build more walkable neighborhoods and you want to build housing in more walkable neighborhoods, you need the, the developers to do it, you know, or, or you need to become a developer and do it yourself. And I think that that's a message that I would like to get out to more people is developers play an extremely important role in shaping our cities. I mean, you know, your favorite restaurant, the house you grew up in, the school you went to, all of that was was literally built and put together by developers. You know, think about how important that is. So if you want to shape this city, you know, there's lots of ways to do it. You can do it from a media point of view, like you're doing it. You can do it from a public policy point of view and join, you know, the political side of things or architects, planning, et cetera, et cetera. I think what we're really missing in this movement is more people being the developers and pushing it, pushing it forward that way. Because at some point we can have the best plans, the best policies, the best zoning, et cetera, et cetera. But if no one is going to actually like do the thing and like build the buildings and make it happen, it won't happen, you know, even with the most perfectly laid out plans. So I guess, you know, if you said, if there's one thing we left out, it would be my call to action to urbanists to become developers <laughs> like yourself, you know, like whether it's like build a duplex in, in that, you know, yes to my backyard, build the duplex in the vacant lot next to you or down the block or whatever, rehab that, that empty house and turn it into something beautiful, et cetera. Like become the developer, I think is, is maybe the thing that I would like to leave people with. Well, it's interesting too, because I, I think one of the things that we end up hearing from a lot of, of developers of sprawl is that, hey, we're, we're just building what people want. And, and the pushback that, that we have been seeing in, in urbanism is not true. We're not giving any other choice. And so, you know, if, if we don't have good development and attractive places that are within walkable, bikeable distances, then, you know, then, yeah, families do end up moving out to, to the suburbs because that's really the only viable product that they feel like they have. To your point earlier is that, you know, what what person, what family that, you know, would prefer a single family home wouldn't love this particular development? This is gorgeous. And it, and it happens to be on a footprint that is uh, more affordable and walkable, most, more sustainable from a strong town's perspective, uh, you know. Yeah. So I guess a little bit of it is, you know, the whole chicken and egg thing of, you know, we as a population do need to speak up 
We need to come together uh, within our groups and start talking about it to bring us back around to our conversation from earlier. Start talking with your 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 family and friends and your neighbors and 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 talking about these urbanism types of things in a non-threatening, non-pushing way. Obviously, like we talked about earlier, because for many people, this this isn't in their their radar. You know, they're not. They're, this isn't on their scope. This isn't in their vision. Um, but at the same time telling these positive stories and saying, yeah, th- this is kind of cool. What, what's going on in, in Charlotte and you got to check out this, you know, pl- you know, camp, camp Northern, this is really good stuff. Yeah. No. And, and, you know, even kind of going back to what you said about developers are saying we're building this sprawl single family houses. Cause that's what people want. Okay. I think they're wrong. I, you think they're wrong. So isn't that a great opportunity for us to like bet against them? You know, like I I'm willing to bet that they're wrong and I'm, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to build the opposite of that because I think they're wrong. And I think that more people should, should consider doing that. Like, if you're sure that they're wrong, which I think we're, you know, me and you and everybody listening is sure that they're wrong, let's hop in the arena and, and like, build the opposite of it and prove, prove that they're wrong, you know? And maybe it's you do it yourself as a job or maybe you, like, find those local developers and you, you even speak up. Like come to the city council meetings and speak up for the people who are trying to to build these projects. You know, it's easy to to say, you know, you want this project, but then it comes up in front of city council. A lot of people are going to the NIMBYs show up. You know, they really do show up in force to to fight against some of these things. So let's show up as NIMBYs together and say, like, no, th- this is we, we're putting our foot down. We want these uh, kind of developments in our neighborhood. We want to push this forward. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm willing to bet on that and to kind of put my, my career in, in that way. Cause I, I think it is the future. Yeah. And so for, for folks that are getting a little agitated and triggered right now, and they're like, ah, <laughs> you're going to take away my suburban home. Don't worry. They're not going anywhere. There's still going to be a, a, a legitimate market for that type of housing. What we're really talking about here is again, like we were talking about with mobility is creating choice. Uh, we we just haven't had this level of choice. I mean, literally, when we go to the T-shirt that says legalized housing in most of our North American cities, it's been illegal to build, you know, the, this type of housing. And so it's we're just now getting beyond that point and legalizing the ability uh, to to be able to have uh, denser housing products for people who do choose. That's what they would prefer. There all, will always be a market for that traditional single family home in the suburban, exurban environment. It's don't worry, folks. We're not Ill, we're not advocating that that become illegal. It will be there for a long time to come. Uh, the question really is, is, as since we know that it's incredibly unsustainable from a financial model, uh, what will happen to those developments in the future? But we'll come to that when we get to that. <laughs> but we're, right now, we're really focused on trying to do uh, some very viable infill development so that we can get some places that are, you know, livable and sustainable and desirable uh, so that we have some choice. And being able to reimagine, you know, locations like this that are close in to work centers and uh, in cultural hubs, uh, you know, like the center of, of Charlotte. I mean, what a absolute diamond in the rough being able to identify this property and be able to develop it. And the fact that, like you mentioned earlier, you've got the, the rail line going right through the middle of it. Hopefully, well, hopefully one day we do. Hopefully one day. Yeah. yeah. It's, you, you have um, to keep your fingers crossed, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> eventually, since it's not yeah. actively running right now, hopefully you'll be able to come to that, that uh, negotiation. Exactly. We hope so. But, you know, I, I think the, the future is very bright, in my opinion. I think there's a lot of momentum behind this. One part of that could be I've only recently, relatively recently been introduced to these ideas. So I'm now I'm seeing how many people are talking about it. But it does feel to me like there's something in the air. A lot of, for example, like Yimby in California has been winning a lot. Yimby kind of laws and regulations around the country have have been winning a lot recently in a way that I think is kind of historically unprecedented. So I think the momentum is behind us and and it's it's a great time to be to be a part of this movement, to be having these conversations, to be developing these types of projects, because I think it really is where this country is headed. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm on board with you, Tesho. Team Tesho. Yes. I love it. Hey, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been an absolute joy and pleasure. 
thanks for having me. I hope I can make it out to CNU 32 and catch you in Cincinnati. Yeah, and come visit in Austin one of these days. Will do, will do. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Tesho. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying my content, please consider becoming an Active Towns ambassador. Uh, just head over to the Active Towns website uh, at activetowns.org and click on the support button. There's many opportunities for you to get engaged and involved and become one of the Active Towns ambassadors. Uh, I also have a store uh, where I sell a really cool Streets for People swag out there. So click on the Active Towns uh, store button right there on the website. Again, thank you so very much for tuning in. It means so much to me uh, to have you here each and every episode. Uh, and until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>